I would like to uh, speak today about a message that on seasons how different season requires a different spirit or a different attitude different mindset if you don't didn't bring your physical bible with you you can follow me on the U version bible app click on events and then you can find the notes there or the notes will be on the screen here as well different spirit is required for a different season i will take a scripture from numbers chapter 14 and verse 24 and it's the story of Israel spying the promised land and after they came back 10 spies gave a negative report and two guys gave a very optimistic positive report and then God said I'm going to start at verse 23 he said they certainly shall not see the land which I swore to their fathers nor shall any of those who rejected me see it and verse 24 but my servant Caleb because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully I will bring into the land which he went to see and his descendants shall inherit it forever I would like to speak about the fact that I believe that we are stepping into a new season as a church many people are stepping into a new season in their family in their finances in their business in their life in their spiritual walk with God and God wants us to learn to transition those seasons in a way that can bring him glory and could help us to steward the change of times a lot of people get sick when seasons change physically a lot of you get fever when the moment the seasons change. I believe same thing happens with a lot of people spiritually. When their season change, they get ill emotionally. They get confused mentally. And so today this will help us a little bit to transition properly. I will highlight few examples from the book of Joshua. The guy who entered the season of promised land and I believe they will be relevant to our church and they will be relevant to your life as well. Number one, make up your mind that battles are not bad bondage is when you enter a new season what typically happens is if you have a slave mentality you see all the problems that come in the new season but God wants you to have a soldier mentality where you see his promises in spite of all the problems God wants us to have a mentality where the man who was looking for the treasure in Matthew chapter 13 it says that he saw the treasure and he bought the whole field he didn't buy the treasure he bought the dirt that came with the treasure see many people enter the season of marriage and they only they live with this illusion that marriage marriage is like a promised land milk and honey until you get closer to it and you realize there's giants and there's walls there <laughs> having kids is milk and honey that's what God promises it's amazing until you come closer and you realize that there are diapers and sleepless nights having a business is milk and honey God promises that until you enter into that business and you realize you have to be the one to find a job yes you you do this on your boss because he made you go from five to to four but now when you're your own boss it's exciting but it does have some problems in there everything that God promised you will have problems the moment you come close to that promise and it does not mean that that promise is less of a promise because it has problems it just means you have to make up your mind that the promised land has battles and battles are good what is bad is bondage what is bad is being in Egypt when they beat you that is bad but what is good is when you're in the promised land and you beat the devil that is a good thing you overcome the problems you overcome the limitations you climb the walls you bring down the giants you solve conflicts you resolve problems that is a good thing not a bad thing and so the problem with the slaves is when the slaves entered the promised land and they saw a potential battle it freaked them out because slaves are scared of a battle because a battle reminds them of a bondage but a soldier is aroused excited he's enticed he's battle for a soldier he's like, that's what I live for when Israel came out of Egypt it's interesting that in Exodus it says this and the armies of the Lord marched out of Egypt God did not see Israel as a bunch of slaves. He saw them as an army. In fact, he didn't let them fight right away because he says, though I see them as an army, but if they see a war, they will be afraid and they will go back. So God says, I will give them some time so that they will grow into how I see them. And when they finally went and saw a battle, a soldier should have been like, yes, we're going to have a city for us. But a slave mentality said oh my god there are giants and we're like grasshoppers in that place you can't enter your new season with an old thinking 
you can't enter your promised land if you think like a slave you have to think like a soldier Paul says to Timothy Timothy chapter 2 2nd Timothy and verse 1 he says my son be strong in the grace of God and then verse 3 he says and endure hardships as a good soldier of the Lord see it's time for sons to act like soldiers you cannot act like a slave you cannot act like a survivor because a survivor sees a battle and is intimidated by it battles are good bondage is bad being addicted is bad but having a battle to fight is a good thing because if you don't have a battle you won't have a breakthrough bondages they bring burdens but battles they bring breakthroughs bondage is what happens when you're in Egypt battle is what happens when you're in the promised land promised land is not a life without a battle it's a life where you have victories because of those battles promised land is where you have challenges promised land in business means you will have problems but when you solve those problems God will release promotion problems in marriage is a good thing because that means you will have intimacy after you solve those problems and many people have a negative view of problems in life because they think of them like a slave oh this is just Egypt beating me you're not a slave no more you're a son of God and update your thinking where you view problems as an opportunity to a breakthrough and to a promise so many times we encounter problems in our promised land and we allow the nickel to block the sun. You know it takes a small little penny and you can go outside and take a small little penny and put it right in front of the sun and it will block the whole sun. That's how problems are in the promised land. They are small but they are big enough to block the promise of God if you put them between you and the promise. If you put that problem between you and the promise. People sometimes who build houses you know and it's a promise from God for them. And until they start dealing with the city, until they start dealing with the workers that are building the house, with the loans and everything and the tension and the pressure and the challenge that comes with it. A lot of times when we give, have a breakthrough in the ministry and God is doing great things, you know, our ministry is growing. It's expanding but it creates problems. It creates tension. It creates complaining people. It creates people who have issues. It creates sometimes systems that are outdated and sometimes the problems they become so real and we're like man but I thought church growth. I thought that the revival in the church will not cause that. That's an illusion. Promised land according to the Bible will have giants and God will be with you and he wants you to think differently. Make up your mind. The battles are good. When you and your wife fight it's a good thing. As long as nobody ends up in a hospital. When you fight it's a good thing. That means the disagreements will bring you closer to intimacy. As long as you don't raise your voice and you don't raise your hand. And as long as a husband you keep your mouth shut and your wallet open. Help us Jesus. Make up your mind. Battles are, are not bad. Bondage is. You know, when, when, you, when you hit a promised land and, and you see all the problems in it, remind yourself, I dreamed of being here. You dreamed of being married. Unfortunately, the dream became a dread for some of us. A dream became a nightmare. You dreamed of having kids. You dreamed of having your own house. We dreamed of having our services packed to the capacity and then starting a second one. We dreamed of having conferences somewhere else. I dreamed that God will open doors to the nations and everything but with it comes pressure. With it comes sleepless nights. With it comes sometimes troubles and some issues and, and challenges that we have to climb. And in the midst of those challenges we should not despise the promised land like 10 spies did and say well because it's so hard, because it's so difficult. God never said that life will be easy. He said his yoke is easy life will never be easy especially if God starts promoting you life will get harder because your responsibilities get bigger that is why your relationship with God has to be so close so you don't draw your identity your happiness from your responsibilities because they'll only add pressure to you and God's presence will add your strength can somebody say amen I dreamed of being here some of you dreamed of being where you are complaining about and God wants you to make up your mind have a different spirit 
two people look at the same problem one says this is horrible and God came and says you're right it is horrible you're gonna die in wilderness the other guy came in and says yeah I see the challenges but honestly I'm excited why I'm a soldier I thrive on a battle I want things to get hard why because I'm gonna find a better solution and yes I have sleepless nights for a few months but I'm gonna find a resolution and I will have a breakthrough after that God is faithful God is good he is on my side and I'm about to have a breakthrough I see a miracle coming in my life I see a blessing coming into my life I'm not afraid of the battle the devil is afraid of me because greater is he that is inside of me than the one who's in the world come on somebody touch your neighbor say make up your mind battles are not bad but the second thing I want us to remember when we transition seasons is not only that we have to make up our mind but also we have to get the Bible inside of us God said to Joshua Joshua 1 verse 8 he says do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth you should meditate any day and night and then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success it's interesting that God tells a general of an army Joshua is not a priest he's not a Levite and he's not a preacher Joshua does not need to study the Bible to preach sermons Joshua does not need the Bible to make teaching material God tells him get the book inside of you why does that has to happen because in the new season your success is directly connected to the scripture directly connected in the wilderness they got the law but in the promised land God says the law has to come inside I put it on the tablets but I want you in the promised land put it inside of your heart now I understand many of us in here today are sitting and you say Vlad that is good that's actually for you you need to study the Bible that is true hundred percent but God was not telling a pastor to put the book inside God told a leader of a nation if God tells a leader of a nation in the promised land to put the Bible inside of him then God tells a leader of a business to do the same. God is telling today a leader of a house to do the same. A leader in a family to do the same. You have to put the Word of God inside of you. Why? Because promised land will create situations where life will get so difficult it will squeeze what you put inside of you. Life is like hot water and you're the tea bag. When you put the stuff inside of you in that bag when you put the fragrances inside of you, when you put the Word of God inside of you, at first you just provide a good smell. But wait until we put you in the hot boiling water. Other people quit. You shine. Why? Because when you squeeze an orange, orange comes out. If you put a tea inside of a hot water, tea comes out. And God says, I want you to begin to put my word inside of you. Why? Because when the pressures come, when the troubles come, it will squeeze out of you my word. At right now it may seem like oh I'm just memorizing the Bible I'm just meditating on the Bible it doesn't do anything except take my time and fill my mind but God says wait until I put you in the hot water then the world will see what you're made of then your family will see what you're filled with and then your circumstances will come out because something will come out of you that you put inside of you if the word is in you you will make your way prosperous if the word is not in you, you will wait for your way to make you prosperous. Joshua 1 8 says this, do not let the book of the law depart your mouth. Meditate in it day and night. And then he says this, then you will make your way prosperous. Watch this. God does not say Joshua, you will not depend on someone to make you prosperous. When you have the word in you, you affect what's outside of you when you don't have the word in you you will always depend on everyone to make you happy and everyone to make you successful and everyone to treat you just right so you become at peace God says you get the word in you he says you will make your way successful Joseph if they throw you in prison you will make that prison successful if they throw you on the cross Jesus you will lead another person to salvation why because if the word is in you you will affect the world outside of you if you don't have the word in you you will depend on the world around you to treat you right. You will always attack people and say, you, you're not nice to me. Listen, my friend, if you have the word in you, you will make your way prosperous. You will make your business successful. You will make your family prosperous. God says that. You will always depend on the outside if you don't have the word on the inside. You will always depend on the outside if you don't have the word on the inside. In the new season you cannot depend on others to make you happy because others depend on you 
to make them successful. And how do you do that? God says very simple. Joshua, this word has to go inside. That means you got to memorize it, maybe one verse a week. You got to read it every day and you got to meditate on it. And it's interesting, he says day and night. I found that a problematic. I'm like, why is he going to meditate at night? See, when you enter a new season, typically you don't sleep at night. <laughs> if you ever enter the new season in your life, you don't sleep at night. And that's why God says, I don't want you to worry at night because your new season is keeping you awake. Meditate. See, some of you, you, you maybe you, you feel like, oh, blah, blah, you don't understand. I have this obsessive complaining disorder. <laughs> it's time to change your medication to God's meditation. Ah, Jesus. Mic drop right there. That's why in Psalm 1, God says, blessed is the man who doesn't walk, blessed is the man who doesn't sit, and blessed is the man who doesn't stand. And he says, and his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in it he meditates day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which brings fruit, fruit in its season. He says, whose leaf shall not wither. And then there's this powerful verse. It says, and whatever he does shall prosper. When you get the word so deep in you, God says something. It affects your business. It affects your family. See, some of you see uh, the Word of God, the preacher needs it so he, because it's his material. I just need to know a lot about my business. God says in the new season, your success is connected to the Scriptures. Please pick up the Bible again. Please make it a standard for your life. Please begin to memorize the Bible. Begin to read the Bible. Begin to let it read you. If I ask, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but how many of you know 12 football teams right now? The names of 12 football teams. Many hands will go up. But if I ask you, how many of you know the names of 12 disciples? hands will go down. If I ask how many of you know the 12 players or the 12 people that are employed by Seahawks team, many hands will go up. But if I ask you how many of you know the names of the 12 sons of Jacob, many hands will go down. Because God wants you in this season to know more about his word than about Seahawks. God bless the Seahawks, God bless the football and the basketball, but his word is connected to your success, not anything else. Can somebody say amen? Number one is that I make up my mind battles are not bad. In the new season I embrace pressure, I embrace hardships as a good soldier because I'm not a slave and I'm not a survivor. I am a successful person according to God. Number two is that I make God's word a standard for my life. I, I'm not just reading it, I'm letting it come inside of me. I'm filling my life with His word because then I don't depend on my way to make me prosperous. I make my way prosperous. Whatever you put me in, put me in the hot water, good stuff will come out. Put me in the good water, good stuff will come out. Number three, I would like you to highlight this is we have to cut complaining because the war in the promised land is not won by whining, it's won by worship. The first thing they did when they entered the promised land is God says, I want all the men to be circumcised. You can google what circumcision is. It's a practice that I thank God we don't have to do today in Jesus name. And when they were circumcised, something happened. The scripture says is that now the reapproach of Egypt has been cut away. And when you study the book of Joshua, you see something, it's a contrast between wilderness and between the promised land is that in the promised land, Israel did not complain. They had problems, they were big. They had walls, they were high. They had no war equipment to overcome those challenges. They had very challenging situation in the promised land. You just don't see nobody complaining. In the wilderness, all they did was complain. All they did was complain. Smallest problem and they complained. But when they entered the promised land, one of the things that God did is God circumcised them. And God says, I don't want you to have a mindset and an attitude of a wilderness and bondage in the promised land. Because you can ruin your promised land if you act like you were acting when you were in the wilderness. In the wilderness, the order of the day was whining and complaining. Every problem had one response from you and that is, why is this happening to me? God left me. Well, this shouldn't be happening to me. I'm better than this and everything. God says, I want you to cut complaining. Because your wall in the promised land is not going to come down because you whine. God says, I want you to bring your walls down because you're going to walk around seven days and you'll be silent. Why? Because if you have nothing good to say, shut your mouth. Zip your lip, muzzle your mouth, God says. It means if there's nothing positive, zip it. Seven days. 
the wall is still standing if you cannot say anything good shut your mouth and on the last day God says you're not gonna cry you're not gonna complain and you're not gonna whine you're gonna shout in the wilderness we whine that's why when you complain you remain you can't move forward if you complain in the promised land God says you have to change how you react to the same problems you don't complain you war you worship you work you act differently so many people ruin their promised land of marriage because they complain in marriage all the time husbands don't look at your wife our wives don't look at your husbands you will ruin your promised land if you complain that's why God wants to roll away reapproach of Egypt God wants to rem remove he wants you and I in the promised land not to complain about all of the problems but to worship in spite of them to worship in spite of them uh, when it was snowing one of the things that we have problems because this is an older building we have a coffee shop roof that it leaks the moment the snow begins to melt and it, when it leaks it's not a pleasant sight because the ceiling begins to look like somebody peed through the roof <laughs> mold grows it looks nasty none of you come up like oh my gosh let me just take a selfie next to this it's, it's it's embarrassing for us as people who are in this church it's embarrassing to have that to have that leak how many of you know that the problem is not with the rain it's with the roof when there's a leakage we don't blame the rain we don't blame the snow we fix the roof when your mouth is leaking it's not because you have the rain outside it's because you have a problem with your mouth no my husband is the problem your house is not leaking when it's snowing why because you have a good roof and so what God wants to teach us in the promised land is that in spite of who is snowing and who is raining in your life God says I want your mouth to be a well sealed roof that nothing bad comes out because when it comes out bad you're leaking your outside problems into your life you are creating a mold you are creating your life begins to stink and that is why God says promised land will have a rain and it will have a snow but I want you to cover your roof I want you to cut complaining out teach your mind teach your mouth teach your attitude to say I will respond to everything I will not have anxiety I will with praise with prayer and thanksgiving and supplication offer my request to God and after that if I have nothing positive to say I will zip it and I will praise him that's your neighbor say cut complaining number four in the promised land don't be smart be wise smart people save first wise people give first and the moment they entered the promised land not only God circumcised God asked them to be circumcised I believe it speaks of cutting complaining out of our life but God also said the first city that you encounter I want you to give that city away to me smart people say that's dumb I need to save first because that's a smart thing to do wise people said you know what there is a God he graciously provides all things what an honor it is to partner with him by making him be involved in my circumstances if you believe there is a God there is a real God I want to tell you something that he wants to be first in your life in the beginning he asked Abel Abel offered the firstborn God was pleased with it when they went into Egypt God asked for the firstborn of children to be given to him not in sacrifice but in offering God was pleased with that they come into promised land and God says I want you to give me the first city and nobody had a problem with it except one one uh, one guy Achan we see in Matthew 6 it says seek first the kingdom of God God does not want all of your cities he wants the first and you will be wise if you put him first now your and I and my challenge is we have a wisdom of God and we have the smartness of man and the smartness say you're dumb if you give your first 10 percent to God because you should save that but I want to let you know that God is real 
Now some of you maybe are coming today and you're like, my Vlad, you know this whole thing of giving first to God, I don't believe in that. Putting God first in my day by spending time in the Bible, I don't believe in that. I don't believe God exists and all of this stuff. And I just want to throw something your way. I recently wrote a book and people in my generation, they say, well, everything in this world came out of a Big Bang. So Big Bang and all of the intelligence happened and many scientists believe in that. None of the scientists who believe in that were there. None of them. If an explosion happened at the printing press in Amazon in Seattle, how many of you would believe my book Break Free appeared as a result of an explosion in Amazon printing press? 27,000 scientists believe in that. If I say that, how many of you will say, well, I, I'm not a scientist, but I'm also not an idiot. A book, my book did not appear because of an explosion at the printing press. It happened because I wrote it, somebody edited it, somebody designed a graphic, somebody took a photo of it and because Amazon took it on, Amazon printed, they had printing, somebody designed all those things. Same thing, we did not come on this earth because of an explosion. I am sorry if that ins uh, insults your intelligence, I just not that smart but I don't really have a hard time believing that you and I came intelligent beings from some kind of a bang in the universe. We came because there's a creator and the greatest proof that there's a creator is you. It's the creation. The greatest proof that there is an author is a book and so we believe that there is a God but because there is a God as Christians we want to put him first in our dealings. In your new season God says I want you to put me first. Maybe before in the seasons you put God last but in this new season don't be smart be wise put God first. And so Achan of course he wasn't wise he was smart he says well you know what I'm gonna take some of this gold I'm gonna take some of this silver I'm gonna take Babylonian garment and I'm gonna put it and save it in my in my savings account and God did not bless him for that. Now I'm not saying God punished him in fact when they experienced defeat God didn't come and say ha huh? you didn't put me first provoked my jealousy. I'm a revengeful God. God is not a revengeful God. He's a jealous and a holy God. He did not punish Achan. What he did is this. He withdrew his manifest presence from Israel and left Israel alone to fight alone. Unfortunately the battle that they were engaged in had spiritual forces behind it and because God was not on their side their strength was not enough. I just want to encourage somebody here today. When you don't put God first, God is not going to punish you. He will just withdraw from you. And he will say, since you don't want me engaged, go ahead. And then most of us in some areas will succeed in our family. Building a marriage, building a family and building a business. Until we come in contact with demonic powers. Until everything will be fine. And there will be a small problem. You will say, oh, I I'll fix this. And if there's a demon behind the problem, you're done. You're done. That's exactly what happened to these people. They were finished. Why? Because the enemies, the real spiritual enemies, your education, your experience, your money, none of it comes in contact. None of it overcomes the spiritual forces. That is why one of the reasons I tithe. Because I want God to be on my side when I face, face spiritual world. That is one of the reasons we take first three days to fast. We want to honor God first. Why? So that the rest of the month we say, God, we want to do it with you. We want to do it with God. You will not be able to overcome spiritual challenges, my friend, without God's help. And God says, I want to be first in your life. See, some of you here today, you're tipping, not tithing. Meaning you give God at the end of the month whatever is left. Listen, put God first this season. This year, do something different. Put God first. Take the first from your paycheck and honor God with it. Take the first from your process and honor God with it. See slaves, see giving as a waste. Sons, see giving as worship. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9 and 10 it says honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase and then your barn will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with increase with new wine. If you want to see God's blessing giving is not giving. Giving is worship. Giving is an act of honor to God. You want to be wise? Be someone who gives this year. Give first and then God begins to bless the rest. Not only in finances. Give first in your day. When you wake up, take first few minutes spend with God. Give first few days of the month to the Lord and you will see how He will begin to bless the rest of the month. Are you with me? 
I'm bringing this message to an end number five don't live on yesterday's success and don't dwell on yesterday's defeat Bill Gates says success is a lousy teacher it seduces smart people to thinking they can't lose the mistake that Joshua made is he went to the next city based on the success of the previous one and he got whooped I think it was Babe Ruth he said yesterday's home runs don't win today's games you have to depend on God every single time you can't just have a formula. God doesn't give you a strategy that works for every battle. God gives himself and says, I want you to be connected to me through every single battle. And I will switch the strategies. I will switch the approaches. I will change different things. Why? Because when the winds of change, change in your culture, you have to change along with them. Not to conform to the culture, but to adopt. Yesterday's success cannot be today's strategy. There's no formula for victory. We need God even in small battles. But Joshua not only had success and he relied on and made a mistake. Joshua also in the promised land made a mistake. He did not consult God and he accepted Gibeonites based on what they said. It was a tragic mistake. But Joshua did not wallow up in that mistake. In fact, he made the Gibeonites he made mistake with work for him. In the promised land, God does not want your mistakes to define you. He wants you to employ them, learn from them. Wise person learns from other people's mistakes. Smart people learn from their own mistakes and foolish people don't learn anything. If you're not wise, at least be smart in this area. <laughs> learn from other, learn from your own mistakes. When you made a mistake, it's not over. The next day God gives you new mercy. You can turn your mistakes into your mentors. You can turn the things that you've done that maybe you cannot delete. I know people in this room there are things that you did that will stay on your record for the rest of your life and anytime you look at it you feel embarrassed. Do not feel embarrassed. After you've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ let Gibeonites work for you. But it's on your driving's record. Yeah, Gibeonites did not leave but they worked for him. Let those mistakes remind you never to do that again in next season of your life. Let those mistakes remind other people, listen you don't have to do this. Why? And don't be ashamed because of what happened because Jesus Christ removed the guilt but he's leaving the Gibeonites. He says employ them for your good. Don't be ashamed of it but be reminded for good that not to do that again. And lastly, is you have to steward the spoil. Breakthrough can't become a blessing if you don't have a budget. For Joshua, we're about to take an offering and we're going to pray for offering today. Joshua entered the promised land and if you read book of Joshua, first half of the book is so exciting. A lot of war. It's like watching like a, some kind of a battle movie. Great, great war scenes. It's exciting. And the remaining book of Joshua is the most boring part you can find in the Bible. It's because it's when they divide the book, divide the land for different tribes. You're reading, you're like, man, I really don't care how many acres that tribe got. And then this acre, and then this, and this. And, and I ask myself, why is the other part included? Because God did not want them to fight the whole book. They fought half of the book. The other half of the book, God says, I want you to budget your breakthrough. And how many of you know budgeting is boring? How many of you know that allotting your breakthrough to different investments, different accounts, different projects, that is the boring part. We like to make things but God wants us to manage things as well. See God gave them a breakthrough because they fought but they did not got a blessing because they fought. They got a blessing because they budgeted what they won. I want to speak to somebody this year blessing of God upon your life depends on few things. One is that you have to put God first. Secondly is you have to win some battles. Uh, battles for some of us in here we need to actually show up to work early, leave late and produce in our work so that we can have a raise. Because you can't expect a raise if you don't up your production. If you want to have a blessing you need to first have a breakthrough. And many of us do not have a breakthrough because we're lazy, because we're not hardworking, and because in our work we spend more time on TikTok than actually doing our job. And then we frustrate everybody and everybody keeps giving us rides up and we're about to be fired and we say, God bless me. God says, I can't give you something to be blessed if you don't have breakthrough. And you can't have breakthrough if you sleep in your battle, you don't win battles. This week, go to work and see it as a battle, conquer something. 
create a new idea make your workplace a better place give someone something that they will have to pay you more because you're bringing a greater benefit than what you're getting paid for right now bring a breakthrough to your work bring a blessing to your work bring cookies to your work bring donuts to your work come earlier leave later put yourself into your work so that you will have breakthrough because you won a battle at your work then you will have a blessing but the third part I think and this is the part that some of us struggle with today is that we actually have good breakthroughs we're hardworking. we manage our companies really well we meet the quotas we exceed that expectation in our workplace we're moving the needle further and we have the breakthrough but when we look back at the end of the year there's nothing in our account and it's because maybe we need to learn not only how to win a breakthrough but how to budget a breakthrough that it turns into a blessing Joshua excuse me Joseph had seven years of breakthrough but Joseph was smart he didn't eat everything that he made like prodigal son he created some storehouses meaning he created a budget for him and his nation he said we will eat this we will eat this but this we will save this we will put into retirement this we will put into investment this we will help some missionaries and some orphan houses and he budgeted the breakthrough and after seven years when the famine came and everyone was struggling he became a multi-billionaire why because when you steward your breakthrough good at times will come and you will reap a compound effect of that and God will promote you above those people who ate everything they made and he became the most powerful man in the world and made Pharaoh the richest man in the world and while everybody still survived he thrived because during his success he did not eat all of his success he stewarded well the moment you get a raise it's not a time to upgrade your shoes it's not a time to upgrade your phone it's not a time to upgrade the zip code of where you live that is what many times survivors do and that is why they have nothing to show even though they want breakthroughs but because they don't steward their breakthrough they don't have a blessing they're still broke your breakthrough will not make you blessed if you don't learn the art of a boring budgeting and money management what do you do it's very simple basic things you give first 10 percent you save the next 10 percent to yourself then you manage the rest of the 80 percent by curving your spending you put a restraint on your appetites clearance and sale is not God's sign <laughs> Apple's new products is not God's voice saying to you that you have got to have it and after you curve your spending you avoid borrowing some debt is good most of it is bad so you avoid putting everything on the plastic you some of us we need to have a plastic surgery <laughs> cut the plastic after that not only that but we might need to uh, be wise in investing that means when you have extra it's not just time to buy liabilities liabilities are things that depreci depreciate with time that you take those things and you do what Joshua did he spent half of the book budgeting he spent half of the book planning and management you take some extra and you look for opportunities where you can invest I'm not a manager um, in, in investment expert, but you don't invest what you don't understand. That means just because everybody is doing, you don't put money into investment because you don't, if you don't understand it. Secondly, you don't invest with money you don't have. Meaning you don't call your dad and say, dad, can I borrow 20 G's? Why? Because there's a great investment opportunity. That is not wise. And you don't invest to get rich tomorrow. Investment usually pays dividends with time. You invest, not just save, not just cut the budget and not just pay off debts and also you work hard avoid borrowing and if you want to be blessed instead of stressed budget your breakthroughs the Lord has really uh, put on our heart this year last year this time we did a sacrifice Sunday we encouraged everyone to ask God what does he want you to give in other words give everything that you have <laughs> and then a lot of people gave everything that they had this year we won't do it like that we would like to ask you to put God first in your finances this year and not only in the main job that you're making money off but out of the things that you do on the side maybe you have some kind of a, a profit that coming on the side put God first there as well for those of you you see God prospering you right now beyond measure ask the Lord maybe he wants you to increase your percentage me and my wife you know for the last few years we increased our percentage of giving but I don't believe God wants every person 
all the time to give everything that they make. The same way I don't believe God wants every person all the time to fast. It's not healthy for the body. And if we are going to teach that every person all the time should give all of their proceeds away, that might happen for a season. For us it happened for about four or five years where everything that we made went into the house of God. Every savings we didn't save money. And after that I was so afraid to save money because I, I knew all it takes is God to just whisper during worship and everything would be gone. So before that worship I would just spend it on buying some weird lame stuff so I don't have to always give it away. And the Lord broke that fear and He said, Vlad, I want to teach you not only to to win battles I want to teach you to steward your breakthroughs I want you to teach not only to give but also I want you to learn how to steward your breakthroughs how to save how to invest how to pay down debts and how to use the money to make money we, the last few months we've had different special offerings where we raise money for Vietnam we raise money for a family in our church and we would like not to do that today but during this tithing and during this offering Whatever God placed on your heart, whatever you prepared. I ask you for those of you who've been coming to church but you don't give, that you make a decision this year to honor God with the first percent, with the first fruits of your income. Be smart. Excuse me. Be wise. <laughs> You've been smart. Be wise. Put God first and you will see God will begin to move into your life. For those of you who are giving God your first, but honestly you're struggling right now. Can you ask the Lord to examine your financial spending? Can you ask the Lord to examine, do you have a goal for this year for your finances? Can you ask the Lord, are you living on a budget? Or are you simply ramping up debt and you're realizing you have breakthroughs but you don't have blessing, you're broke. Maybe it's not the problem with breakthrough. Maybe the problem is you don't have a budget. And this year this has to change. You don't have a vision. This has to change. God wants your business to prosper. God wants your family to prosper. God wants you to have more than enough for you and to meet the needs of other people. But you do have to do the boring part. You have to fight, you have to win, and you have to budget. I want us to rise to our feet. Let's take our offering into our hand. We're going to pray. As we give into the vision, as we give into the purposes of God for our church. If you're giving today, you can fill out the envelope right in front of you, legibly. You can also give online. You can also give by just putting a cash or check to make to Hungry Gen. If those of you watching us online, you can participate in this as well. This is where our worship is expressed as well. Father, we thank you for your mercy and for your grace. Lord, we thank you for the breakthroughs that you give each one of us in business, in work, in school, in college. And Lord, as we're stepping into a new season of our life, we make a decision today to honor you first. We make a decision today to cut complaining, put your word first in our life and to renew our thinking. Lord, but I also pray that you will help us not to rely on yesterday's strategies and approaches, but give us new ideas for this season. Holy Spirit, I ask you for every person in here, not just to be someone who wins battles, but also who stewards their success as well. So that they can see more victories, so they can see more blessings in their life, and so that they can be a light and a salt of their generation, Lord. As we give our offering today, we trust in you to provide for us richly. We trust in you to protect us from disease and pestilence and attacks. We trust in you to protect us from accidents. We trust in you to untie cases in the court system right now, Lord God, and to bring your blessing into our life that we can steward it well for your glory, God. In Jesus' name. Hey, this is Pastor Vlad, and thank you for watching this sermon. Please click on the subscribe so that you can be a part of our Hungry Generation YouTube community. And click on the bell as well so that you can be notified when we upload the new sermon. Thank you for watching and God bless you.